the weary traveller driving up the A9 from Edinburgh bound for Inverness might be tempted to take a brief detour along the B970 in search of rest and refreshment. About a mile from the boot of garden, the traveller may come across this rather idiosyncratic structure, a cairn standing alone in the remote highland countryside. Interest peaked, the traveller may briefly pause and upon closer inspection will find upon it a plaque engraved with the following inscription in Gaelic and English. John Roy Stewart, 1700-1752. Born and raised near here was a celebrated Gaelic poet, John Roy Stewart, one of the most heroic figures of the 45 Rising. A devoted Jacobite, John Roy raised the Edinburgh Regiment, which also included men from Strathspey. He won great acclaim for his bravery at Preston Pans, Falkirk and Culloden. Remember the people from whence you came. Erected by the 1745 Association. But who was John Roy Stewart? What is his poetic legacy? And what were the heroic deeds during the rising of 45 that he performed? In short, why did the 1745 Association build this monument to his memory quarter of a century ago? These are the questions that I shall endeavor to address in the life, poems, and legacy of John Roy Stewart, Bard of Culloden, a history in six chapters. Chapter one, education of a bard, 1700 to 1735. John Roy was born in the district of Kincardine in Speyside around the year 1700 to older parents. They were both on their second marriage, having been widowed, and it is reported that his mother was over 50 when he was born, which, if true, is a remarkably advanced age for a woman to have given birth to a healthy baby boy in the year 1700. Once his parents had got over the shock of hearing John Roy's little feet patter in their home, they secured for him a good education in Inverness, completed by a grand tour of the continent of Europe, where among others he met Simon Fraser, the exiled Lord Lovett, forming a friendship with him, which was to last a lifetime. On his return to Scotland, he was commissioned as an officer in the Scots Greys and also developed as a Gallic bard. I'll make five general comments about John Roy's poems by way of introduction. Firstly, they are composed in Gaelic. The only exception is John Roy's psalm, which was in English. The fact that they were composed in Gaelic explains why they're not better known today, because few people today speak Gaelic. They were composed in the Bardic oral tradition. That is to say that he memorized them and spoke or sung them at Cayley houses and taverns and highlands, rather than writing them down on paper. And this explains why only a few of them survive today, just 14 poems in all, extending over 815 lines. A third point to highlight is that John Roy uses alliteration, assonance, rhythm and rhyme extensively. These are well-established mnemonic techniques which assist memorization. Fourthly, they have a broadly common structure. They're typically six to 10 beats per line, and they are organized in quatrains of alternately rhyming couplets. Again, quite an easy form to memorize, the sole exception being the Silk of Clan Hatton, which doesn't conform to this structure. And finally, they are all to some extent autobiographical. In his poems, John Roy is telling the story of his own experiences, his own emotions, his own reactions to events in which he personally was involved. And his surviving poems 
divide into three main groups. The first are three early poems composed prior to 1735. The second is four poems of love and romance composed during the 1730s. And the final and probably best known group are the Culloden poems composed in 1746 as John Roy sought to come to terms with the Jacobite defeat at the battle. So to conclude this first chapter with what is undoubtedly the greatest of John Roy's early poems, one that still inspires poets today, the lament for Lady Mackintosh has a very fine contemporary French translation by the Breton poet Christian Souchon. Souchon's translation is not word for word, but remains faithful to John Roy's Gallic original in the powerful use it makes of metaphor, evoking the forces of nature itself in mourning the early death of Lady Christian Mackintosh, wife of the clan chieftain. Here are a few lines in Gallic and English from the lament. And I'll just say the opening verse in English. Where are the gods and heroes who will guide me through this veil of sorrow? Even the moon and the shining stars and the golden sun are sunk in gloom. Chapter two, the 1730s, poems of love and romance. In English, the single word love covers a range of different emotions for which the ancient Greeks had a number of different words. And John Roy's poems cover love in different aspects. The first of which the, the ancient Greeks would have called philia. This is the song to Barbara of Downey and appears in Ronald Black's anthology, Anne Lazaire, under the title John Roy's letter, because that's what it was, a verse of eight lines in a letter to a female friend, Barbara of Downey. In this letter, John Roy tells Barbara that he's down on his luck and he's, he's sleeping rough, with no parlor, no pantry, no home and no floor, no bed but of rushes, and no girl to adore. And in response, Barbara gives John Roy a measure of consolation and support. So this is an example of philia, a long and enduring friendship with one friend, John Roy, down in his luck and the other, Barbara, offering moral support during a difficult time for him. The second poem in this series is an expression of what the Greeks termed eros or romantic love. The poem dedicated to Mary Grant opens I saw a dream last night come as a light to me. John Roy is clearly infatuated with Mari and the poem continues in like fashion with the dreamlike vision continuing to haunt John Roy. In the eighth verse, he says that, I saw a dream of a maiden shine like a sunbeam on me. But for whatever reason, perhaps Mari is betrothed to another, perhaps, John Roy's affection is unrequited. In the end, he realizes that his love cannot progress. And the poem concludes, though on the morrow must I leave and never more return until death comes to call me home. For Mari, I will yearn. However, John Roy does find love after he parts from Mari in the arms of the one who is the subject of the next poem, Song to My Sweetheart, perhaps the gentlest and most sentimental of his surviving poems. This is an expression of a third type of love, which the ancient Greeks termed pragma, lacking what the Greeks termed the mania or mania of obsessive love or the eros of romantic or erotic love, Pragma describes a long-standing affection between two people, a pragmatic collaboration for mutual benefit. In the poem, John Roy does not name the object of his affections, and we find out why. She has fallen pregnant by him, and they are unwed. 
he wishes to protect her good name. But what is he to do? In his song, John Roy decides that for her sake and the sake of their unborn child, they must wed. Take my greetings and my blessing to the most beautiful girl. Give your hand and your promise. You will be a friend all your life. The final song in this group literally translates from Gaelic as a song between himself and a girl. I translate it more simply as John Roy's lullaby. It opens with John Roy singing to his baby daughter, my girl, you are my heart's delight. This is what the ancient Greeks termed storger, a natural, instinctive, familial love, the unconditional, protective love of a father for his child. But how can John Roy secure his child's future? As the poem progresses, she starts crying. And for John Roy, it is as if the baby is remonstrating with him for not being a better father and looking after her. In the end, he arrives at a solution. We'll bring across young Charles, he says, and then the wheel of fortune will turn. So like many leading Jacobites, John Roy supports the rising of 1745, not just because he believes that the Stuart dynasty should rightfully occupy the throne, but also because he believes that their restoration will restore his fortunes and secure his baby daughter's future. On learning that the Stuart standard has been raised at Glenfinnan, John Roy immediately secured passage on a merchant vessel bound for Britain. He joined the Jacobite army at Blair Athol on September 1st, 1745, and was greeted by open arms by Prince Charles as one of the few leading Jacobites with proven military experience. John Roy is then dispatched north to persuade this man, his old friend Lord Lovett, to raise the clan Fraser for Prince Charlie. Then, as now, personal networks and friendships are more important than manifestos in mobilizing support for a cause, and John Roy succeeds in persuading Lord Lovett to commit his clan to the cause of the young Chevalier. He, on return, he engages at the Battle of Prestonpans, and after the victory there, he is appointed colonel of a new regiment, the Edinburgh Regiment. On October 30th, 1745, a crucial council of war is held in Holyrood Palace to decide the next step in the campaign. John Roy is the only regimental colonel not to be invited to attend this council, and he is not at all happy at being excluded, saying later that he thought he had not been invited because it was known that he would have opposed the decision to march into England, recommending instead that the Jacobites should consolidate their position in Scotland. Notwithstanding John Roy's reservation, he joins the Jacobite army in their southward march into England and advanced to within 120 miles of London, when, with the capital lying wide open before them, another council of war at Derby on December the 5th, 1745, took the fight fateful decision to turn back. John Roy served under Lord George Murray at the successful engagement to cover the Jacobite retreat at Clifton in December 1745, and again at the Jacobite victory on Falkirk Muir in January 1746. However, despite victory at Falkirk, the momentum of the campaign of 1745 had now shifted decisively against the Jacobites. In one last roll of the dice, they launched a nighttime assault on the Duke of Cumberland's redcoats in Nairn, whom they confidently expected to be drunk after celebrating the Duke's birthday. But the two Jacobite columns, one under Lord George Murray and the other under the Prince, are separated in the darkness. As dawn breaks, Lord George, concluding that the element of surprise has been lost, gives orders to his men to return to camp. John Roy is livid. There is a furious row between him and Lord George. John Roy accuses Lord George of treachery, 
Lord George threatens Lord John Roy with arrest. The rift between the two men never heals. The following day, the Redcoats advance from Nairn to the Jacobite encampments on Dramossi Moor. John Roy's regiment is positioned on the front line between the Frasers of Lovett on his left and the Stuarts of Appin, his blood relatives, on his right. And on the fateful and bitter day of April 16th, 1746, John Roy leads his brothers in arms, hungry and exhausted after the night march, on one last desperate charge over the Sodden Moor. And they alone, of all the Jacobite regiments, along with Lochiel's Camerons on the right of the Appin Regiment, reach the Redcoat front line, fighting furiously to the very end. But for the only time in the campaign, the Highland charge is broken. Chambouad Achbaz and Dan Ruin. Not victory, but death was our destiny. For John Roy, as for others who had risked all for the Jacobite cause, the battle is an unmitigated disaster. Chapter four, the Bard of Culloden. The Swiss psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, seen here in this photograph, identified five stages of grief that she said all humans experience after a catastrophic loss. The first is denial, then anger, followed by bargaining, then depression, and finally, some kind of acceptance. It is my contention that the poems that John Roy composed after Culloden were his way of processing the loss that he experienced at Culloden. Stage one, denial, the declaration of Muir Lagan. Two weeks after Culloden, two ships landed in the West Highlands, delivering 3,000 standards of arms and legendary Loch Arcade gold, enough to convince John Roy and a few other Jacobite diehards that they could continue the campaign. So they signed up to the Declaration of Muir Lagan with a ringing declaration to commit to the cause of the Bonnie Prince, and I quote, all the able-bodied men every one of us can command, unquote but few are willing to join a new effort. And then even John Roy could no longer deny that the campaign is over, at least for the time being. He heads for the hills of his native Strasbourg and vents his frustrations in Culloden's Day of Dust. Probably the least known of John Roy's surviving poems, which appears in no anthology of which I'm aware and perhaps with good reason. Frankly, it is not very good. It is not so much a poem as a prolonged rant against the Duke of Cumberland and denial of what has happened. Stage two, anger, the second stage of grief. The Silk of Clanhattan. Anger is a dominant theme of the second poem in the sequence. The Silk of Clan Hatton, sometimes known as Another Song on Glodden Day, which opens, I am in utter torment. My spirit has fallen to the earth and tears teem from my eyes. This is no mere poetic artifice written from an academic ivory tower or the traditional garret attic of the imp impoverished bard. This is a cry of angry despair uttered from the depths of the soul of a man whose world has come crashing down around him. The Silk of Clanhattan is not so much a poem as a series of staccato sobs, whose fractured and fragmented structure in stark contrast to the ordered quatrains of John Roy's other poems, reflects his own psychological disintegration at this time and his greatest anger is reserved for William, Duke of Cumberland. May William, son of George, be as a tree without leaves, without a twig, without a branch, or even 
shoots of a branch. May your hearth be bare, lacking wife, brother or son, without the sound of a harp or candlelight. Even three centuries later, the contempt and bitterness that John Roy feels for the butcher is palpable. The curse visited upon the Duke in the silk of Clanhattan did indeed come to pass. Cumberland did die unmarried and childless. His military career after Culloden, one of failure, his reputation in tatters as the truth about the atrocities committed after the battle come to light. However, this is a very dangerous time for John Roy. If he succumbs to the anger and despair of the Silk of Clanhattan, then his ultimate fate is inevitable, capture and death. And not the swift death of a warrior in battle struck down by the stroke of a sword or the shot of a musket ball, which he had faced many times, but the most agonizing and humiliating death devised by man, by hanging, drawing and quartering. And so another emotion begins to overwhelm John Roy, an emotion even more powerful than anger, fear, and a fear bordering on terror. We know this because in the one poem John Roy wrote in English that survives to this day, John Roy's psalm, the words, I shall not be afraid, are repeated twice in the opening two verses. He is like a child in the dark, using the power of auto-suggestion and repetition to overcome his primeval fear. In his superb rendition of John Roy's psalm, the American songwriter, folk singer, and music historian, Charlie Zam, gets into the psyche of the Jacobite colonel. As the psalm progresses, we can almost hear John Roy's shattered nerves begin to steady and a fragile confidence begin to return. He appeals to his God to save him and he strikes a bargain. He will choose life over death as long as his God protects him. Yet despite the bargain he has struck, John Roy is not restored to the devil may care troubadour of his younger days. His next poem, John Roy's Prayer, is another conversation with his God, his only companion during the long days and nights he spends alone on the run in the mountains. John Roy is clearly still feeling very sorry for himself, but he is past the utter despair of the silk of Clanhattan. John Roy's prayer composed in 12 four-line verses of alternately rhyming couplets opens as follows. By a streamlet tired and worn, the good Christian John Roy sits alone, a warrior weary and forlorn, in wretched spirits with a fractured bone. John Roy is passing through the fourth stage of grief. He is depressed. Chapter five, acceptance, the final stage of grief. Is Latha Truilodere the greatest Gallic poem ever composed? John Roy's depression only really starts to lift when he is reunited with his prince in Cluny's cage at Ben Alder and sails with him to France and to safety on board the Herreur on September 20th, 1746. It is during this period that John Roy composes Latha Trilodere, the day of Culloden, which is clearly influenced by his conversations with the prince during this period, mirror, mirroring as it does the prince's views on the causes of the Jacobite defeat. And it is my submission that the day of Culloden, John Roy's last and most complete poem, merits consideration as the greatest Gallic poem ever composed. Why? What makes a great poem? It should fulfill five criteria. Firstly, it should be on a great theme. And what greater theme that can there be for us here in Scotland's capital, Edinburgh, than the matter of Scotland itself? 
emerging like a phoenix from the ashes of the 45 towards a higher world. Second, a great work of literature, whether it be prose or poetry, must express deep emotions, as the Day of Culloden does in expressing John Roy's profound grief and his mourning for the fallen, and perhaps also his mourning for the passing of the Highland culture and the Gaelic language. Thirdly, it must be beautiful in form and language with a poet's emotions conveyed in a way that is rhythmic, elegant and coherent, as the Day of Culloden is a much more controlled and balanced expression of John Roy's feelings than his earlier poems on the battle. Fourth, a great poem must reveal a profound truth. The truth that John Roy reveals in the Day of Culloden is not a balanced historic truth, as might be reported by a reputable historian or journalist, where every source is checked and every statement independently corroborated. It is a deeper existential truth of the world as it is seen in the consciousness of John Roy through his mortal peril at the very heart of the fighting in the last battle on British soil and, let us pray, the last battle that ever will be fought on British soil. And finally, it should transcend time and place to touch the heart of those who hear it in a different age and across far distant lands. The day of Culloden marks the final phase of John Roy's catharsis after Culloden and his last known poem, perhaps because after its composition, he had nothing more to say. So let us close this chapter with a few lines from the poem, seen here in Gaelic and in English. Great are the depths of my sorrow as I mourn for the wounds of my land. I weep for each of the white corpses that lie on the side of the hill, abandoned, unhonoured, unshrouded, untouched and unburied still. Chapter six, The Legacy. Not much is known for certain about what became of John Roy after his escape from Scotland with the Prince in September, 1746. Some say he died as early as 1747. Others say he faked his death to cover his intelligence activities as he sailed back and forth between the continent and Scotland. Some say he became a sort of Highland Robin Hood, a constant thorn in the side of a repressive regime, always ready to help the poor and dispossessed. Others say, that many of these stories were elaborated in the Cayley houses of the Highlands to add lustre to his legend and raise morale at a difficult time in the Highlands. Some say he was the model for Alan Breck Stewart in Kidnapped. Others maintain that he was at best only one of many influences on Robert Louis Stevenson's characterization. But However he was portrayed and whoever is portraying him, John Roy is invariably represented as a courageous patriot whose spirit is never vanquished. Why should the heart yearn, wonders William Neal's exiled John Roy Stewart? Why should the heart yearn for the drizzling crags of home and the poor hovels that scatter the heather on the damp mists of the West. A country of drovers, vendetta and harsh words of an old and dying poetry of forgotten heroes. And what in these brown glens or in all Scotland could buy the elegance of one Parisian street? Now that the walls of the Neden of the Kings no longer are defense, the last battlement is the hedge of my clenched teeth around a tongue that carries the rough Gallic of Strasbourg. This 
is the poor excuse, the last defense that turns my face to the rain and breaks my heart. So what, in conclusion, is the final legacy of John Roy Stewart, Colonel of the Jacobite Edinburgh Regiment, or as John Roy himself might have described it, the Regiment of Dunedin of the Kings? Well, today there is, to the best of my knowledge, no surviving portrait to show us what John Roy Stewart may have looked like. His poems can only be understood in the Gallic language in which they were composed by a few thousand people. The sacrifices he made and the risks he took were all for naught, for the Jacobite cause to which he dedicated his life ended in abject failure and he died in poverty and in exile. So one might be forgiven for concluding that the life of John Roy Stewart was not exactly one of unalloyed success. Yet he did leave a legacy in the few of his poems that survive, which inspire modern poets like William Neal and Christian Souchon, as well as my old friends in the 1745 Association who built this modest monument to his memory in his native Strathspey, close to the place of his birth during the dying days of the last millennium. The spirit of the die-hard Jacobite partisan still touches those who, like him, have suffered traumatic loss or who are living in exile from their homes or who have stumbled somewhere along the boulevard of broken dreams. And the message that he sends is this. Whatever troubles we may face in a turbulent world, however desperate things may sometimes seem to be, However bleak our prospects, while there is life, there is hope. And while life and hope endure, we can never be defeated.